Hey everyone, welcome to day four of Trend Math Camp. We'll wait a few minutes for everyone to get here uh, and then we'll start. Just checking, you two can hear me, right? Yeah. All right. Gosh, I think Kobe is here. Maybe from other. So I see in the Q and A, people are asking what we're doing today. So today we're talking about complex numbers.
Some, someone asked why the picture. Um, so this picture, I'm pretty sure, is a picture of the, uh, something called the Mandelbrot set, uh, which is, uh, and that kind of relates also to like Julia sets as well. Um, some of you might not know what that is, but today, like after we go over today's lecture on complex numbers, you'll know, uh, you, if you did a quick Google search, you'll at least understand what, what these two sets are and like how, how, you know, we can get these images. So stay tuned. All right. I think we should be good to start now, Foyas, unless you're seeing anything. I think we're good. Let's maybe go over some homework, or perhaps we start with like polls and things like that today. Yeah, I think let's get started. Wait, Foyas, I can't hear you. Unless, one sec. Not try? Yeah, can you hear me? No. Um, Audio. Sorry about that. Sorry about microphones. Oh, voice can Akash not hear us? Yeah, you can, can you hear us now? Akash. I was doing something wrong with my headphones. It's all good now. All right. Very great. So <clears throat> uh, I think we're good to start. So maybe we can start as usual with the with the poll. Let's do it. All right. Everyone should be seeing a poll. Um, as usual, just some fun questions to start the day. Hopefully most of you have read Harry Potter, or at least know of it. Um, if not, definitely watch it or read it. Yes, I agree. I think my favorite is, I think Order of the Phoenix. That's the book that almost made me stop reading the series. Really? Why? Oh, I don't spoil it. Why? It's it's very long. Um, it's it's one of the longest ones, and I think it for me it took a while for things to get going. Is either that or Half Blood Prince? Really? I don't know. I, I really was a fan of the uh, Deathly Hollows book. Fair. I, I just like that series. I like the I like each one as it went on. Favorite season, okay, that's a... Getting a lot okay. of answers right now. Favorite streaming service, either Netflix or Disney. There's a lot of YouTube. Really? Well, I guess uh, it, I can probably, it's probably because probably of the Trend Math Camp YouTube channel that everyone's subscribing that's to. That's right. Of course. No, I can see a lot of these answers. Oh, we forgot. We forgot Twitch. Okay. Uh, oh, Twitch <laughs> for the game. I guess I don't know. I was thinking more TV shows and movies. Unless there's something in Twitch I don't know. Anyone have like any favorite movies? Perhaps you could put it. We didn't put this one in, but perhaps you could put it in the chat. Inception. Christopher Nolan movies. No, I don't know what my favorite movie is. I think hard about that. All right, almost 90% of you have voted. So let's wait a little bit less than a minute and then we should share the results.
All right. Just gonna share the results. So we have a tie with Philosopher's Stone and the Goblet of Fire. Interesting. Uh, Goblet of Fire, if I remember correctly, was Rowling's like breakout book, I think. Really? I, I think people took it more seriously when someone finally died, and it was also a bit longer oh. than other ones. We don't know if we got this one. Oh, my gosh, you can't be spoiling it. I didn't say oh. who. Who? We gotta cut that part out on the YouTube. No, it does. It's all good. Um, I find the same. Harry Potter dies. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Philosopher, Philosopher's Stone's an interesting choice. Um, I was really surprised by YouTube. No, I mean, I, I feel like there, there's always, you know, you just, you just, you, once you like start watching videos on YouTube, you know. Oh, yeah. I interpreted differently, I guess. Yeah, I, I thought more of it like... Like YouTube shows. Yeah. No. YouTube's Very definitely... That no one voted for HBO, Showtime, or Apple. I, I've watched some stuff on Apple. Oh, wait, gosh, was this single choice? Yeah, it was single It might have been. It might have been. I see. Okay. Well, yeah, okay, then. If it's single, it should have been multiple. Although we did say favorite, so. Yeah. Winter is surprising for favorite. Oh, that is very surprising. Yeah. A more, I, I, th I, I think I would go with summer. Very surprising. We have a lot of winter people. I mean, I would definitely go summer just because more free time. But if, I were, nice if I were free the entire year, just weather-wise, I think I'd probably like spring the best. Most people don't have pets. Most people have younger siblings. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I, I think uh, both me and Akash have younger siblings. I have three younger siblings. All right. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna go over um, to begin some of the homework problems uh, that you guys had last night and talk about some of the questions you had. Um, and then after that, for those of you who weren't here when I announced it, today we're gonna be talking about complex numbers. Uh, so first some homework, and then after that we'll get into uh, complex numbers. So let me just screen share and then we can talk about the homework. So I guess we should start with uh, problem 14. So that was the first one for homework. Uh, and the question is, how many positive cubes divide 3 factorial times 5 factorial times 7 factorial? So let's just talk through it together. So first, whenever you have these kind of how many whatever divide something, it's always a really, really good idea to prime factorize. Prime factorizing. Uh, is very, very useful. So uh, we just do it in one step here, but just in case you're curious as to a good way to do this, um, you could, because these numbers are fairly small, you can kind of just, I guess, decompose each one of them and then just multiply them all together. Um, so you get that it's two to the eighth times three to the fourth times five squared times seven. So that means that a perfect cube that divides three to the fifth, sorry, three factorial times five factorial times seven factorial is um, a product of its prime, so two, three, five, and seven, and the exponents have to be multiples of three. Um, so hopefully this is clear. Uh, this is basically getting at the idea that, uh, for example, this is cubes, but let's just talk about the square example. Uh, if you have a number that's a square, then all the uh, exponents in its prime factorization are even. Um, so for example, what is a decent square? Let's say six squared, right? So six squared is 36. And then if we prime factorize that, that would be two squared times three squared. And then you'll notice that both the exponents are even. And that's actually the case for all squares. And then the, the reason that is, is because 
you can think of this as two times three squared. So this two times three is that six. So if anything's a square, you can just put its square root in the parentheses and then a two on the outside. And then once you put the two inside, it'll what, whatever these exponents are, so right now they happen to be one and one, um, but whatever they are, when you multiply them by two, they become even. And then you can see a similar thing would happen with cubes and three, because instead of um, a two there, you'd have a three, and then the three would go inside and make all the exponents multiples of three. So uh, that's the logic as to um, how we know that this a, b, c, and d are all multiples of three. So now that we know they're multiples of three, that leaves us with very few possibilities. So we just write all the possibilities out here. Uh, so a can be zero, three, or six, b can be zero, three, c has to be zero, and d has to be zero. Uh, so just to explain uh, why do we stop at six, like why, is, why don't we keep going to nine, 12, and so on. Uh, so that comes from our initial prime factorization. So any divisor of this number, its prime uh, exponents have to be less than or equal to these ones, right? Because let's say, for example, you can't have two to the third divide uh, two squared, right? Eight can't divide four. If something divides another thing, um, it has to be smaller divides a bigger thing. So uh, that's why you have to limit these possibilities so that you keep your number smaller. Uh, and then um, as all combo problems go, you multiply all your possibilities. So you have three times two times one times one, which is six. So ultimately you find that three factorial times five factorial times seven factorial has six cubed uh, divisors. Also for those who are interested, I'm fairly certain that three factorial times five factorial times seven factorial is equal to 10 factorial. I feel like that's, that has to have come up in some problem before. Um, Anyway, so I'm just gonna check the chat and Q&A to see if I, we have any questions. Uh, let's see. Can we say that seven factorial and five factorial are divisible by three factorial? So we de derive that they're three factorial cubes totally, so it's six. So the numbers work out for you very well in that case, uh, but I'm not sure about that logic. Um, so first off, let me say it's definitely true that seven factorial and five factorial are divisible by three factorial. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the number of cubes that divide it are three factorial. Because you could also make the argument that, you know, two factorial divides it, four factorial divides it. Um, so I think it, it's somewhat of a, I guess, by chance that it happened to work out that way. Yeah, I think with the cost, thing. yeah, I think with the cost, like I, I agree, I, I, that that logic I don't think will always work out. I think just the numbers worked out in this case, um, but I yeah, I don't think the logic works out. I think just the main key here is to um, understand like that prime factorization is really important when you're looking for like divisors of something. Um, so yeah, yeah. All right, so it looks like I can move on to the next one. So go to problem 15. Uh, Foy, do you wanna take this one? Uh, sure. Uh, so problem 15 asks how many uh, different integers can be expressed as the sum of three distinct members of the set uh, 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, and 19. All right. Um, okay. So I, I hope you guys did this for homework. But if you notice here, I think the key here is you have to really um, be really clever with um, this the, the, this first trick, um, which is that we first subtract 10 um, from each number in this set, and then we divide the uh, we divide the result by three, um, and ob obtain the following set. Um, and so, why does this work? Just in, I mean, I guess I'll explain the solution, and then I'll explain why it works. Um, so from here, when you have this set negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Um, you can see that um, we can get any integer between negative six and six inclusive um, as the sum of these three elements. And you can verify that yourself. Um, uh, but that gives us a total of 13 different integers. And so that's our answer. But the reason why this first trick works is um, essentially we're doing like, uh, we're doing like something called like a linear transformation on the numbers. Um, 
So we essentially, we're, we're allowed to take away 10 from each number because this will only shift, um, this will shift all of my numbers, uh, all of my possible sums down by the same amount. Um, and so we're not adding or introducing new numbers into the set uh, when doing that. Um, and we can also, the same thing goes for dividing by three. Um, so usually when you have a linear transformation, um, you'll usually have like some number X in a set going to um, uh, some like a y plus b, um, or you you could say a x plus b y equals a x plus b. So I think yeah, yeah. And then also just to that that's definitely very important to understand. Uh, but also just to add on to one thing about the thirteen, uh, just in case that didn't come uh, so easily to you. Uh, the reason that it's between negative six and six is because you basically just consider the biggest number you can make and the smallest number you can make. So the biggest is when you add your three biggest numbers, three, two, and one, so that's six. And likewise with negative six. And then because your numbers are just one apart and you have zeros and ones, you can get every integer in between. So negative six is your max, sorry, is your min, six is your max, and then you can get everything in between. So that's how you get 13, just in case um, that wasn't quite clear. And even if you don't want to use linear transformation, you can see from the original set that the maximum is if you sum um, 13, 16, and 19, uh, and you get, what is that? You get um, 48, I believe. Um, and then the minimum is 1, 4, and 7, which gets you 12. And with the very similar logic with the, like with the new set, you know, the differences between each number is by three, right? So you can access every number that is basically a multiple of three from 12 to 48, right? Because like instead of one, four, and seven, if I pick one, four, and 10, then I get 15, right? And then I pick 13 instead of 10, I get 18, all right? And I can keep going until I get to 48, right? So from 12 to 48, you know, you can do a very similar strategy, divide all of those by three. Um, you know, you get four to 16 inclusive, and then, you know, subtract three, and you can see very easily that there's 13 numbers there. Um, so, you know, very, very similar. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is a little bit harder, so let's check the chat and Q&A, but it looks like we're good. Um, so then let's move on to the last one, 16. All right. So you want to know how many subsets of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine uh, contain at least one prime number. Uh, so the first thing which is uh, important to know is that if you have a set with n elements, then the number of uh, subsets is uh, two to the n. Um, so the reason that's true is because uh, each element in your set can either be in your subset or cannot be in your subset. So for each element, there's like a true false kind of decision. So for each element, what you do is you multiply by two. So if you have n elements and you multiply by two n times, uh, then what you have is two to the n. So in this case, n is eight. So we have 256 possible subsets. And then we only want the subsets that have at least one prime. So then we use this idea of complementary counting uh, that we learned yesterday. Uh, so the idea is you find the opposite of what you want. So because there are four uh, non-primes, in other words, composites, uh, that means that there are uh, 2 to the 8 minus 2 to the 4 sub uh, equals 240 subsets with at least one prime. Um, so the reason that this is 2 to the 4 is because imagine uh, creating uh, subsets just from your composites. So your composites would be 4, 6, 8, and 9 and you want to find how many subsets you have there. Well, we use the same exact formula, right? You have four elements and you want to find the subsets, so it's just two to the four. Um, so then that tells you how many subsets you don't want. So you take the total number of subsets, subtract off all the ones you don't want, and what you're left with is what you do want, which is 240. It looks like we're good. Uh, 
Yeah, it looks like we're good. All right. So then I think we can move on to uh, complex numbers. All right. Are you seeing the complex number stuff now? All right. So uh, just to start off, so today's about complex numbers. Um, it's definitely a very uh, big field, so we'll try to um, introduce you to it. Uh, we'll, of course, have some uh, problems ready for you. Uh, but you know, keep in mind that it's a very, very uh, big field, so there's still so much to explore after just two hours. Um, so we'll, we'll do our best to get through the most um, important and fundamental parts. Um, but uh, hopefully we can also dive into some of the more um, uh, branches of complex numbers and uh, see some applications as well. So this was an image. We might be able to get into that. Uh, it definitely does relate to complex numbers. Um, so before we get to complex numbers, uh, let's talk about numbers that we actually understand first. So the real numbers, that's probably the numbers that you've worked with uh, for basically your entire life. So um, and when you think about visualizing the real numbers, uh, you do it on something called the number line, right? You just draw this line and it extends infinitely to the left, infinitely to the right. And then if anyone tells you a real number, you can just uh, write a dot and, or point at it or something. You, you know where it is on that line. So if I told you three, you could easily just point to three. And then as you can see, five and negative five are dotted. And the reason that you can represent it on a line is because real numbers consist of just one component. So that might be a little bit of um, a weird concept to wrap your head around this idea of one component, but um, that definitely will make more sense later. So what I mean by one component is that um, if you're told just one piece of information about a real number, so if I told you like seven or 7.5, uh, you would know exactly where on this number line uh, to go to. But sometimes you need more than just one piece of information. And by piece of information, we call it component. So an example of this is the plane. So I'm sure if you've had any experience with geometry, you've probably seen the plane or the coordinate plane. Uh, I think some people call it uh, the Cartesian plane. Um, so the plane, this is kind of the formal mathy way of writing it. Uh, so it's called R squared because um, each, each like uh, set element of the plane uh, has consists of two real numbers. So you, that's why you have the squared there. And uh, it's basically made up of, of ordered pairs. So um, you can think of these as points, right? And then uh, each element of the plane, it can't be described by just one component, right? If I told you one, you can't point to anywhere in the plane. You would just ask me if I'm crazy. Like you can't just be told one and then try to find one on the plane. So what you need is you need more information. So if I told you one and two, or in math, we just write this for shorthand, one comma two in parentheses, like a point, then you can point to a very specific point in the plane. Out of all the elements there, there's just one that satisfies one comma two, and then it's a uh, place right here. So you can see that um, we can point to one comma two. So uh, this is just getting at the idea that each element of R squared, or in other words, the plane, consists of two components. So I'm sure you've heard this before, but there's the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. Uh, and that's why we need a two dimensional object, the plane, uh, to visualize it, right? You can't place, you can't think of the plane in a line, right? You need that um, second uh, axis to really think about and visualize uh, these points. So this notion of two components will be uh, very important for us going forward. So just another uh, example of something with two components, but now instead of um, something geometric, uh, now let's consider actual numbers. So um, if you haven't been exposed to complex numbers and you've probably just been dealing with you know, integers, um, rationals, like fractions, or maybe real numbers, those all really just have kind of uh, one aspect to them. Um, so there's this thing, it's, it's, it's looks a little fancy. It's called, um, it's read out loud, z adjoin root two, or z brackets root two. 
And then uh, this is, I guess, the math way of describing that set. But um, I think a more intuitive way to understand this is really just that uh, what this set represents is all the numbers of the form uh, a plus b root 2, uh, where a and b are positive integers. And the reason that this number has uh, two parts is you kind of have a being the rational part, so that's just um, a pure integer, and then this is your irrational part, right? Multiples of root 2. Um, so that's just what z adjoined root 2 is, and now let's get into uh, why do we care, what's important about this set. So as I said earlier, um, before we see, we saw uh, um, a geometric object, the plane um, whose elements had two components, but now we're seeing an example with numbers. So again, just to reiterate, um, this is the rational part and this is the irrational part. So um, even though it's just one number, you kind of have these uh, two different number systems uh, pushed together into one thing uh, to form just one type of number. Um, so you take the rationals, you take the irrationals, you just slap an addition sign on there, and then you kind of get this, this, uh, this number that has um, two components. So again, just to go back to that example of, um, I cannot just uh, tell you one and then you would know what number I'm talking about here, right? If I told you one, do I mean the B is one? Do I mean the A is one? Is it just root two? Is it one? Is it one plus one root two? Um, so I, you need two pieces of information, right? I'd have to tell you four or five, and then you know what I'm talking about. Then you know I mean four plus five root two. So again, you need uh, that two pieces of information. Uh, and for it's just uh, stop me whenever you uh, see something. Sure. All right. So this might be something you've seen before. Uh, it comes up in our uh, math team name. Uh, it's kind of something that even if you don't know anything about it, it's just something that somehow people just hear. Um, but what is the square root of negative one? So uh, let's think about, we're first going to ask ourselves, why do we care? Like, why are we asking ourselves that question? So just going back to a couple days ago when we were looking at inequalities, if you remember how we proved AMGM, uh, we used, at least for two variables, that is, uh, we use this property of the real numbers, right? We said that any real number squared is non-negative. So if you take negative one squared, you get one positive. Uh, five squared, you get 25 positive. Uh, zero squared is zero, so that's the only time it's not positive. So that's why we write non-negative. And then uh, sometimes this idea is known as the trivial inequality. And uh, this kind of leads us to the question, okay, so then how do we square something and get a negative number? Or in other words, what is the square root of negative one? What is the square root of, of negatives? Um, so we know it's not a real number, right? Because uh, of the trivial inequality. Um, so what we do is we define it to be a number called i. So let's get into a little more about i. So the definition of i is that it's a number such that when you square it, you get negative one. So uh, the answer to that question, what squared is, uh, is negative or negative one, and that answer is i. And just a little bit of terminology. Uh, so we call one, two, five, uh, 6.7, we call them real numbers. i is called an imaginary number. Uh, so just a little bit of terminology, and again, that's why it's called i, i for imaginary. And then uh, let's just do a quick numerical example. Uh, to make sure that we're a little bit comfortable with this idea. Um, so what is uh, the square root of negative 25? Um, so this is a pretty short question. I think maybe we'll just uh, stop here for around like 30 seconds or something uh, to see if people are uh, understanding, can think about it a little bit, and then of course we'll go over it. All right, so we're seeing a lot of answers in the chat. All right. So yes, the answer is 5i, as like almost all of you uh, suggested in the chat. So yeah, you take root negative 25. And then if you remember this property about how square roots work, you can uh, break them apart by multiplication. So this is the same thing as root 25 times root negative 1. 
So root 25, as you all know, is five, and then root negative one, as we have defined to be, is i. So root negative 25 is five i. All right, so now just a little bit more about i. Um, so we're going to try uh, raising i to some powers. So uh, first we have i to the first power. So that equals i, because anything to the first power uh, is just itself. Then i squared equals negative 1 by definition. Uh, that's just how we defined i. Uh, then for the third and fourth example, we have to be uh, a little bit more clever. So for i cubed, we can break that apart as i squared times i. And then we know i squared is negative 1 from the example above. And then negative 1 times i is just negative i. And then a very sim similar strategy for i to the fourth power. So i to the fourth is i squared times i squared, which is equal to negative 1 times negative 1, which is equal to 1. Now, um, before we move on, uh, I was wondering if anyone can tell why we stopped at i to the fourth. Um, why didn't, like, what is i to the fifth? What is i to the sixth? Um, so you can check the chat. Yeah, so we're definitely getting some right answers. Uh, just in case it's not clear to everyone, maybe we can just compute um, i to the fifth together and see what happens. So actually, you know what? Drawing might be better. So if you try to compute i to the fifth power, then we can rewrite this as i to the fourth times i to the one. And we know i to the fourth is just one. And i to the one is just i. And then one times i is i. So as people are saying in the chat, uh, you loop back around. So uh, when dealing with powers of i, um, you repeat every cycle of four. So i to the fifth is the same thing as i, because um, you just added four to it. And uh, as you can see, i to the four is one, so multiplying by something by i to the four has no effect on the number, right? Multiplying by one has no effect on the number. So now we're just going to move on to a quick problem about um, how these exponents work. Uh, so we'll just give a little bit of time to think about this, and then we'll uh, go over it. And then if you have any ideas or uh, answers, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, so many people yeah. are asking about like why like negative how will negative i work um i think the best way to see it we'll see it just in a, in a couple slides is is with like the complex plane um and so you'll have like a better intuition of it but essentially it would just be negative square root negative one which is a little weird to think about um if this is not familiar to you but you, you'll definitely understand once we go over the complex plane All right, so I think a lot of people are um, putting the chat and finishing up, so I'll uh, begin to go over it. So for the first part, i to the 1709. So someone in the chat said use uh, mod four. So if you're not sure, what, um, if you know what mods are in modular arithmetic, then yes, uh, the exponents uh, work out mod four because the cycle is by four. Um, but if you're not sure what mods are, then we can just show this algebraically. So um, I to the 1709 is the same thing as this expression because uh, if you remember just some exponent rules, um, this is just four times 427 and this would be plus one. And then um, you can check that four times 427 plus one is 1709. So we're just gonna go along here simplifying each way. So we know that I to the fourth is one because of this step earlier here. So then we have one to the 427 times i, and we know i to the one is i because of this step here. And then uh, one to the 427 is obviously just one, and one times i is i. And we use very, very similar logic for i to the 2020. So it's i to the four uh, to the 505, which is one to the 505, which is one. So I believe 
uh, all of you in the chat got it right. Uh, so nice job there. And uh, now that we understand I, let's move on to complex numbers. So earlier we saw this theme of kind of taking two different uh, numbers and then uh, merging them together. So that's kind of what complex numbers do. What they do is they uh, take the real numbers, they take imaginary numbers, and then they, they put them together. So uh, we'll just write the formal notation and then of course we'll break it down. So the complex numbers is denoted by a C. So in the same way that um, the rationals are denoted by Q, integers by Z, real numbers by R, complex numbers are by C, Hopefully that should make sense with the C. And um, they're equal to A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers and uh, I squared, this is just the definition of I. So uh, as you can see, they have this uh, real part uh, called A, and then the imaginary part is B. So um, just something to keep in mind that, you know, somewhat of a common mistake, uh, remember that I is not a variable here. So A and B are variables, they can change. Uh, so you could have two plus three I, you could have five plus seven I, um, but you know, I doesn't change. You, you, like a, you wouldn't ask yourself, oh, I'm solving for I. I is a number, it's in, it's, it's in the same sense that you wouldn't solve for two. Like it doesn't really make sense to solve for two, right? You would solve for X. Um, so I, even though it's a letter, uh, that we use in the English language, it's actually a number. So just keep in mind that it's a number that we've defined to be the square root of negative one. Uh, so you have two variables running around here, A and B. And then, um, so the real part is A because it's not attached to any I. Uh, so then that's called the real part and we denote it with um, R, E, Z. So R, E is just short for real and Z is the complex number. Um, and uh, B is called the imaginary part because it's stuck next to the imaginary unit, uh, I. So um, oftentimes we've talked about how to visualize these numbers. Uh, so for example, with the real numbers, we visualize them in the uh, number line. Um, but for complex numbers, we need a plane. And uh, the intuition for this uh, may, is perhaps coming to you um, is because that uh, complex numbers have two parts, right? They have the real part, which is the A, and then the imaginary part, which is the B. So just to go back to the example that we've been using, you know, again, if I told you uh, five, you would have no idea what complex number I'm talking about. Um, but if I told you five and two, or in this example here in the picture, three and four, then you could tell that I'm talking about the complex number three plus four i. So the way that we uh, represent complex numbers in the complex plane, um, it's just a plane, uh, we just call it the complex plane because we put complex numbers on it, um, is that you, that you can basically think of the um, x coordinate as your, uh, real com as your real part and your y coordinate as your imaginary part. So three plus four i, you can think about it if you just wanna plot it and kind of get to a place that feels comfortable for you. You can think of three plus four i as like three comma four on, on the plane. So this uh, blue axis here is called the real axis. That's where we put all our real numbers of so negative one, zero, one, two, three, four. And then the red axis over here, that's where we, that's called the imaginary axis. And that's where we plot all our imaginary numbers. So you can see here that three plus four i, you just go to three, then you go up to four i, and this is your complex number. And we can visualize every complex number in the plane this way. So, um, Sorry, I'm just checking the chat real quick just because I moved forward. All right, so it seems like we're good. So now let's talk a little bit about the algebra of complex numbers. How do they add, subtract? Um, anytime you work with a new number system, it's a good idea to think about how do the um, things you learned previously uh, uh, translate over to this uh, new area that you're working with. So the good news about complex numbers is that they're very, very intuitive. So they kind of work exactly how, do you expect, how you'd expect them to work. Um, so uh, here you have uh, A plus BI plus C plus DI. Uh, let me just amend an error I have here. Um, so the way it works is that you add the real components and this should be a B because uh, we're adding 
um, the imaginary components. So basically what you do is you, um, you take the complex number, you can think of it in just its two separate parts, the real and the imaginary, out of the real, which is A and C, add the imaginary, which is uh, B and D, and then you have your addition. Uh, subtraction, it's really the same thing. Uh, and again, uh, remember that um, the C is actually a B. Uh, so what you do is you take your real part, subtract by the other real part, and then you take your imaginary part B and subtract by your other imaginary part D. So you have A minus C plus B minus D times I. Uh, multiplication. So this looks more complicated, um, but it works uh, exactly how you would um, like FOIL, so to speak, if you've ever heard, if you've ever heard that. Um, so you just distribute everything. So uh, I didn't write out all the terms here, but I can just walk everyone through it to see how we get to the final step. So first you can do A times C, so that's AC. Then you do A times uh, DI, so that's ADI. Again, I know I said it earlier, but I really want to stress that I is not a variable, it's a number. Then you would do BI times C. So that's B, C, I. And then this last step is a little bit tricky because you have BI times DI. Uh, but if you take the I's and multiply them together first, if you remember, I times I, or in other words, I squared, is negative one. So bi times di is really negative bd. So that negative coming from i squared equals negative one. And then uh, we just group the real parts and the imaginary parts because that's how we like to think of our complex numbers. And then you can see all these numbers are in our um, explanation here. So again, sorry about all the arrows, but the main idea I'm trying to get across here is that uh, complex numbers, if you want to multiply them, uh, just distribute everything and it'll work out perfectly. All right. I would also stress um, the way Akash is doing here, like he's basically grouping the real and the imaginary parts, like that'll, that'll become very, very helpful uh, just going forward, just, just trying to like group uh, your imaginary parts and your real parts together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely um, always try to think of your complex numbers in terms of the real part and the imaginary part. All right, so I'm just gonna move on to division. So division, it probably won't come up as much. Uh, so if you understand addition, subtraction, multiplication, that's already great. Um, but we'll just talk about division very quickly anyway. So uh, if you have a complex number divided by a complex number, it's not um, immediately obvious that, uh, that that's another complex number, but it is. Um, so what you do is you multiply by uh, the conjugate of the denominator. So just a little terminology, the conjugate of uh, C plus DI is C minus DI, or the conjugate of A plus BI is A minus BI. So you just take this plus and you change it to a minus. And then what's really cool about this is that if you multiply these things out, uh, the denominator actually becomes a C squared minus D squared. And the reason we like that is because the thing that was annoying us in division is how we had an I in the bottom. And we really want that. We just want the I on the top. So um, I believe there's a little bit of a typo. I think it should be C squared plus D squared. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so then the, it would be normally be um, C minus because the difference of squares. But remember that I squared is negative 1, so it changes the negative to a positive. Um, so uh, let's see. Right. So then if you multiply the top out, you'll get this. And that shows that it is a complex number. But again, don't worry about division too much. Uh, then this definition of a conjugate. And then the magnitude, that's also uh, somewhat important. So when dealing with complex numbers, it's a little bit tricky uh, to think about what it means to be uh, bigger than another complex number, right? So let's say, for example, um, for real numbers, if you had you know, 5 and 10, it's very easy for you just to realize that 10 is greater than 5. But, you know, is 1 plus 1i bigger than or less than, uh, you know, 3 plus 4i? Um, it's, it's a little bit hard because you have, you have two components. What does big mean? So 
it, there's this thing called magnitude. Um, so I'll just give the formula first, but there's a geometric intuition to this that I think is far more important. So the definition is just the square root of a squared plus b squared. Uh, so to think about geometrically, I'll just go back to the uh, diagram we had earlier. Um, so if we just go back to here, let's just think about what the magnitude of this is. Uh, so I guess first, maybe we can just compute it algebraically. So we have the square root of three squared plus four squared, right? We said the square root of a squared plus b squared. And if you just remember your Pythag triples, you'll get that this is equal to five, or it's just the square root of 25, which is five. So what this means is that the magnitude is actually the distance from your complex number, so this point, to the origin. The origin meaning the point zero comma zero. So the length of this line is called the magnitude. And you can see that because uh, if this is A and this part is B, then that magnitude just by the Pythagorean theorem is the square root of A squared plus B squared as we defined earlier. So um, there is this uh, algebraic way of thinking about it, but I think uh, it'll probably make more sense to you if you just think about it as the distance from the complex number when you plot it in the plane uh, to the origin. And that's how we say complex numbers are bigger or smaller than another complex number. So for example, if you had um, you know, two plus i, the magnitude of two plus i would be the square root of uh, two squared plus one squared, so the square root of five. And the magnitude of three plus four i is five. So root five is obviously less than five, so you know three plus four i is, is bigger in a complex number sense. Um, um, so a couple of people are asking, I think just one thing to know, adding on to Akash, is that sometimes we call the conjugate um, a bar. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how we denote it. And another way we say magnitude is norm. Um, and so we have a couple questions in the chat about um, magnitude and what, so the magnitude and whether it can be negative. So the magnitude can't be negative. Um, and this is just because we're, we're thinking about this. If some of you, uh, for those of you familiar with like uh, vectors, we're essentially finding like uh, the length of that vector, but essentially what magnitude refers to is distance. Um, and here, what, what it refers to is distant, uh, distance um, between the complex number, uh, essentially uh, graphed on the plane, and the point zero comma zero. Um, and so I, that, that, that's how I like to think about it. And yeah, so someone mentioned, um, uh, it, it isn't this related to the Pythagorean theorem? And it, yeah, it's exactly related to the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which Akash has talked about, because you see, um, he essentially, he, he found the length of that, uh, of this, uh, the, 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 the distance between uh, the origin, zero, zero, and this uh, complex number uh, by, by essentially creating that triangle. Um, and someone asked, is magnitude like slope? Uh, magnitude is not really slope. Um, magnitude is essentially just like the distance between two numbers. Uh, so I would not call it slope. Um, slope would essentially be in a Akash's diagram here, it would be B over A. Um, or in other terms, I think in this example would be four thirds. Uh, but notice that the magnitude here is five. So essentially we're just looking at the bit, we're looking at how long uh, this line across through is. Um, and someone asked also, what is a vector? Um, if you don't know about it, don't worry. Um, it's essentially just, uh, uh, it's something with uh, a direction and a magnitude. So uh, that, that's kind of how we define it. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, I, I, would just, I would just understand what, um, that the magnitude is a distance uh, between two numbers. Yeah, yeah, bottom line, definitely uh, just uh, think magnitude is just distance. Yeah. All right. uh, people are asking again what a conjugate is. Um, so conjugate. if you have like, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, if you have anything like, if you have anything, um, I guess in our case, if, when we're dealing with some number a plus bi, we're essentially just taking a minus bi. Um, and you'll see like the graphical understanding of it. Um, later, it, it, for those of you who are on, who understand like geometric transformations, it's essentially a reflection across 
uh, the x-axis. Um, but we'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, and, and in general, usually when you have um, like any sort of like Akash was talking before before about z add going equal to two. Um, essentially, like conjugates are like if you have something like a plus b, the conjugate of that would be like a minus b. Yeah. Uh, don't worry too much about conjugates. I don't think we'll get uh, too much into them today. Um, but yeah, it, it's basically just a plus bi becomes a minus bi. So it's your operations. Uh, and then now we're going to talk about um, what happens when you multiply a complex number uh, by i. So uh, if you take uh, 2 plus 3i and you multiply it um, by powers of 4, um, then what you see is that uh, you get 2 plus 3i, negative 3, 3 plus 2i, negative 2 minus 3i, and uh, 3 minus 2i. Um, so if we, uh, I think yeah. we have, I think we have like a kind of a relevant question before we like yeah. into um, multiplying. Uh, so people are asking like when we do it, in, when we're looking at the diagram, like uh, maybe you want to go back to the other one because it probably shows it more clearly. Right. Um, but people are asking uh, the, y, the y axis, we're, we're treating it as three and y is going to be three i high. Um, Which are you um, talking about this multiplication or are you talking about uh, here? No, 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 go back to the diagram that we had. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, there we go. So people are asking like, oh, isn't it, why is it 4i high and, and why are we using it as 4? Um, so when we're graphing on the real, uh, on the complex plane, it's, we, we don't essentially know like, like 4i is not a real number. So it's very hard to like quantify. And so we have to kind of like think of new ways to quantify it. So when we're, uh, when we're looking here, we're essentially calling the y axis here, the imaginary axis. Uh, and the x-axis is the real axis. And so you really want to see that um, essentially we're, we, we don't have a way to quantify 4i as a real number. So we essentially just use 4. Um, so it's essentially just using like what we have in the Cartesian plane or the coordinate plane uh, to serve our purposes in the coordinate, uh, in the complex plane. And I would maybe you'd like to say something else about that. Yeah, yeah, um, I think I think you covered it there. Um, I do see it is uh, two, so we're definitely gonna uh, give you a break. Um, let's see, why don't we just, yeah, all right. Uh, so it is it is uh, two. Um, so how about we come back at around uh, five to 10 minutes? All right. Um, so feel free to ask questions in the chat or anything. We'll be here, um, but we'll start up formally in around five to ten minutes, just to um, you know give you a chance to get some water, uh, do what you need to do, and then uh, we'll start back up again soon.
Akash, someone is asking about uh, the correction we made uh, on the page before with um, just describing the operations. Yeah. So go back. Let's yeah. Go. So just to, I can edit it here. Um, yeah. So uh, this is supposed to be a B. Yes. Very and this is also supposed to be a B. And then I, there's also, this should be a plus. So those are the um, three things to note. This is a B just because the, um, the real parts add and then the imaginary parts add. So this B is the imaginary part. So yeah, that should be a B. Yeah, and for some of you asking, when we're talking about the imaginary part of A plus BI, that's not equal to bi, it's equal to b. Um, so that's what we say. And yeah, for the uh, we'll get someone asked. Uh, we'll get started around two ten again.
All right. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, so we're going to talk briefly about uh, the idea of comparing parts, and then we'll get on to some interesting problems. Um, so uh, Foy has mentioned earlier that it's a you know, good strategy to always keep your real parts together and your imaginary parts together. And this uh, strategy uh, really utilizes that. So we're just going to look at an example problem. So if you have x squared minus 2x, so that should be a real part, plus root y times i, so root y is your imaginary part, and then you know that equals negative 1 plus 2i, and you want to solve for x and y. So because the real and imaginary components of a complex number are separate, we can compare parts. So really what this is saying is that if you have two complex numbers that are equal, the real parts have to be equal, and the imaginary parts have to be equal. So you can try to uh, think back to the plane, which I'm sure you're more comfortable with. Uh, two points are equal only if their x coordinates are equal and their y coordinates are equal. So it's a very similar thing here. So just uh, carrying out um, that strategy here, just to see an example, uh, you would have that x squared minus 2x uh, equals negative 1. And then if you solve that out, you'll get x equals 1. And uh, you also have root y equals 2, uh, which means that y equals 4. So um, that's kind of how you compare parts. And we'll try to use this in some problems. But before we get there, uh, let's just um, make sure that we're all good. I think so, Josh. All right. So uh, some people are asking in the some people are actually asking um, yeah. whether x, y have to be real. Yeah. So in this case, yeah. we're when, when we're considering, um, when we're talking about like components, uh, like the real parts and the imaginary parts um, of a complex number, usually we, we refer to those as, the, as, as real numbers. Um, so like when we have like some number a plus bi, uh, the complex number, i is the, just, just an imaginary number. And, and putting that number together, that's a complex number. Um, but the imaginary part of of a plus b i is b, um, and so that usually we'll, we'll consider those as real numbers. Yeah, yeah. So when when you hear a plus b i, um, a and b should be real. So uh, here's the problem. I'll just read out loud, and then um, we can uh, think about it for a little bit. So the square root of uh, negative 119 plus so 120i can be expressed as a plus bi. So again, uh, here we mean that a and b are real. And what we want to do is solve for a and b. Um, so we'll think about it for a little bit. Uh, and then uh, we have a hint ready if, if we need one. And then, of course, we'll talk about the solution. Um, I, I would just make sure to note, like you read the problem carefully, we're looking at essentially the square root of negative. Yeah. So I can write it out in um, in equation notation, just if that helps people out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would suggest thinking about like how else you think about a square root, um, or in, in other in, in another sense, like how would you write, um, how would you think about um, square numbers, right? So if like, so if we're looking for the square root of negative one nineteen plus one twenty i. You can think of a negative 119 plus 120i as some, some number squared, right? So think of, perhaps we can think about it like that. Yeah, so I, I, in, the, in the problem that's written out in a more sort of word problem English type of way, uh, this is just the equation, just in case that helps you uh, understand any, um, any better. Yeah. And some questions we're getting. Um, Will we learn this in high school? Uh, yeah, uh, this is usually, I, I believe it's taught normally in 11th grade. Um, that's usually, I think, part of the, like, the, like the standard curriculum, 11th grade. Um, but yeah, if you don't understand it, I, I, I would definitely highly suggest going back to YouTube uh, and reviewing these uh, lectures, uh, just because if, 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 if it may help if you go at it uh, at a slower pace or if you try it. Uh, to resolve and rework these problems.
spend about a minute, maybe a little bit less. I uh, will give a hint, um, and then we'll uh, then we'll talk about it. All right, so the uh, hint, I think Floyd's kind of alluded to this earlier, um, but I definitely recommend, um, so I guess two parts. One, the square root is a little bit annoying, so I would recommend squaring both sides. Uh, and also um, uh, use that idea of comparing parts, so comparing the real part and the imaginary part. So uh, just to reiterate that, square, square both sides, see what you get. Uh, and then um, equate whatever you have as being real and and what's imaginary, and then and then see what kind of comes from that. Uh, we'll we'll go over this in about I guess uh, two three minutes. It looks like some of you are also getting it in the chat, um, but perhaps we can think of if there's actually more than one solution. Yeah, and just one final uh, push in the right direction before we go over it. Um, if you do square A plus B I, uh, so you can just use this as a computation check, but you should get uh, A squared minus B squared uh, plus two A B I. So then this is your real part. And then um, this is your imaginary part. All right, so let's start to go over it. I'm just gonna um, click through solutions. So I should probably clear these annotations. So um, as for the first hint, uh, you definitely wanna square both sides. So uh, when you square both sides, what you get is uh, negative 119 plus 120i, right? If you take the square root and square it, the square root just goes away. And then the right hand side is uh, a squared minus b squared plus two abi. Uh, so that'll look a lot like that if you've ever seen, you know, x plus y, the whole square is x squared plus y squared plus 2xy. Um, the one thing that'll look a little bit different to you is that there's a minus b squared instead of a plus. 
So just keep in mind that's because uh, b i squared is, is is b squared, but it's also times i squared, and i squared is negative one. So um, when multiplying these things out, just make sure you don't drop any negative signs because the i can be a little bit tricky in that in that sense. So um, now the main part of this uh, solution is the comparing parts, right? So um, as I said earlier, I'm just gonna box these. So a squared minus b squared is your uh, real part. And then the coefficient of i, your 2ab, is your imaginary part. And then if we look on this side, 120 is your imaginary part. And then your real part is negative 119i. I'm sorry, negative 119. Um, so uh, as we said, complex numbers are equal only when uh, both their components are equal. So we can equate the two. So we have a squared minus b squared equals uh, negative 119. And then 2ab equals 120. And now uh, we're not even dealing with complex numbers anymore. So what we've done is by comparing coefficients, we've taken ourselves back to some place that we feel uh, much more comfortable, which is just the real numbers. So this is just a simple system of equations in the real numbers. So uh, now we can go ahead and solve it as you normally would um, by substitution. So if you have 2ab is 120, then that's the same thing as uh, b is 60 over a. So you can substitute that into this uh, squared equation. So uh, b squared is 60 over a squared. So that's 3,600 over a squared. Uh, multiply uh, everything by a squared. So the a squared becomes a to the fourth. Um, this, 30, this a squared goes away. So that's why you just see a 3,600 here. And then this uh, 119 times a squared. And then this plus sign there just because we moved it over to the left-hand side. And then uh, you can be a little bit smart about how you factor it. And then uh, you could, by the way, if this factoring doesn't come naturally to you, you can just um, treat this as a quadratic of a squared. Uh, but just to keep things a little bit simple, you can factor this. And then uh, keep in mind that a is real, right? a is real. So a squared plus 44 won't give us any uh, solutions that we care about. So then what we have is that a is either 5 or negative 5. So a is plus or minus 5. And then if we uh, divide, if we look at how we define b, b is 60 over a. So 60 over plus minus 5 is plus minus 12. So we have two solutions, uh, negative 5 and negative 12, and 5, 12. I think um, right. one thing that's really interesting here is, um, I think one person, someone asked this in the chat, is what is the, how, how, how would you deal with like i raised to the 1 half power or um, what is, essentially, what is the square root of i? And I think that's a really, really good question. Like, what is the square root of the square root of negative one? Um, and then you can see that, like, the method that we used here, it can, like, be, can use, be used exactly to solve that sort of question. Like, what is the square root of i? Um, so I would actually highly, highly recommend you guys try that out um, on your own time, uh, trying to find the square root of i um, with this format. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, if you want to be able to replicate the solution for finding the square root of i, it's a very um, great and natural question to ask. Um, so the two steps here essentially were, was uh, squaring the equation and comparing parts. And I guess you could say the third step is solving the system, um, but I'm sure that's something you're more comfortable with at this point anyway. Uh, so I guess there are three parts, you know, square both sides, compare parts, solve the system. So if you want to solve uh, root i, um, just just repeat those steps and if you're unsure as to what the equation is just um we can say that the root i is equal to a plus b i and then um just proceed as usual and then um hopefully you'll find what you're looking for all right so just going to clear the annotations all right so uh another problem again very similar idea just a little bit more difficult um so you have a, b, and c are positive integers uh, such that c equals a plus b i cubed minus 107 i, and then we just give the definition of i, um, and the goal is to find c. Uh, and keep in mind that a, b, and c are positive integers, that's very important. Um, so uh, I guess just to reiterate what we've been saying earlier, they are real numbers, 
And this is actually even a further restriction. Not only are they real, but they're positive integers. Um, so yeah, let's, let's see uh, how we do this problem. Uh, someone's asking, do we express C as complex? Uh, so, uh, no, here C is a positive integer. So all A, B, and C are all positive integers. Uh, so someone's asking a terminology question. So uh, they're asking what um, this means. So this in, I guess, English terms basically just means the word implies. Uh, so I'll write that out. So I believe we probably used it in the previous example. That's why people are asking. Yeah. So. Um, when we say, for example, if we just look here, uh, 2AB is equal to 120. Uh, so if you just replace that with the English word, um, implies B equals 60 over A. So it's kind of just like you have this one equation, and then from this equation, uh, we can do things to it, and then we end up uh, with this way. So uh, if you've ever written that on like a math test or something, you've probably just gone on to the next line. Uh, sometimes I just use that arrow just to save space. Um, but yeah, it just means you have this equation, and then that means that this other equation is also true. Okay, gosh, do you think right. we should get to the solution? Yeah. So uh, the first step, as usual, uh, is to expand out uh, both sides of the equation 
So um, first off, you see this plus 107i here. So we just um, added 107i to both sides. So that comes from this. And then if you work out a plus bi cubed, uh, hopefully you get that uh, it's a cubed minus 3ab squared. Uh, that's, that's the real part. Uh, plus 3a squared b minus b cubed i. So 3a squared b minus b cubed is the imaginary part. And then we just describe this uh, notion of uh, comparing parts. So uh, the complex numbers are equal only if their uh, real parts and imaginary parts are equal. So that's comparing parts. So this is how you know that c equals a cubed minus 3ab squared. Um, so that's just comparing this real part to this real part. And uh, 107 is equal to 3a squared b minus uh, b cubed. And then we just uh, factor out a b here. So that's just comparing parts. And now we kind of start to begin to use the fact that a and b are integers. And also, um, we should note that 107 is prime. So we know that uh, b uh, divides 107. It's a factor of 107 because we have this b here and 107 there. So b is a factor of 107, which is prime. So that means that b is equal to either 1 or 107, right? Because the only factors of a prime are 1 in itself. So now let's say that b is 107. Then we get that 3a squared minus 107 squared right, this is just coming from over here, uh, equals 1. So that means that 3a squared equals 107 squared plus 1. Uh, but then that means that 107 squared plus 1 is divisible by 3, but that cannot be the case. Um, so this is, I guess, a little bit difficult to understand if you don't know mods. Uh, but don't worry about it too much. I can explain it that way. So um, if you do know mods, basically you can think of this uh, mod 3. So what you should get is that 107 squared is 1 mod 3. This is 1 mod 3. So the whole thing is 2 mod 3, not, uh, not 0 mod 3. Um, and you can also just check for yourself, if you don't know mods, that this number is not divisible by 3. Um, so now that we know b cannot be 107, the only other uh, case we have left is that b has to be 1. So if you plug in b equals 1, then you have 3a squared is 108. So a squared is 36. And then that means a equals 6. And you might be wondering, why can't a be negative 6? Well, if we just go back to the problem statement, we see that they're positive integers. So it has to be 6. So then you use uh, your equation for c when you compare the real parts. And that was a cubed minus 3ab squared. So then what you get is 198. So definitely more complicated problem than the last time, but at its core, a very, very similar idea. Um, so yeah, now we'll just check any questions. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the like, uh, really, really, really important strategy, like I just want to stress, um, is re really setting up, you know, the, the, this essentially set separation of like the real parts and the imaginary parts. Because usually with these sorts of questions, what you can get when you you know, split these real and imaginary parts is, is a really nice system of equations um, that we got here. And, and, and since there, since we have uh, essentially two equations, uh, uh, we can, we can just in, in two variables. You know, we, we we can really you know work through that. Um, and, and and there there might be some you know like clever uh, you know clever deductions that we that we might need to make. But usually, for the most part, when you see um, when you work on problems like these, um, like competition problems, I, I would suggest just trying to, you know, trying to trying to use what you know and like put them in, in in some nice format that you think would be of use to you. Yeah. Um. All right. So there is another problem here. I think in the interest of time, it's probably best we move forward, and then we can either come back to this or this would probably be actually a really great homework problem. So uh, why don't we go to, uh, so we've been talking a lot about complex numbers in a sort of algebraic way, way, right? We have A and B, 
We have I, we can compare parts. So that helps us solve a lot of problems. Um, by the way, should know, just knowing how to compare parts really will help you solve like many, many problems. Um, but let's get back to this idea of um, multiplying by powers of I, because um, there's a lot to be said, uh, both algebraic here, but also we're gonna get into the geometric part of complex numbers, which is pretty interesting. So first, we multiply by the first power of I, four powers of I. Um, so you might wanna ask yourself, why four? Uh, so you might wanna think back to that time when we were uh, raising I to some powers and the pattern we saw there. So it means think to yourself, why four? Um, so for the first case, uh, two plus three I times I to the zero. So I to the zero is obviously just one, and then one times anything is itself, so that case is not particularly interesting. Um, then times I to the one, so if we multiply this out, we get two times I, so that's what you see here. And then three I times I is negative three, right, because the I squared becomes negative one. So then you get negative three plus two I. Uh, then you have two plus three I times I squared. So remember, I squared is just negative one, so uh, you just multiply 3 by negative 1, so the 2 becomes negative 2, and the 3 becomes a negative 3. Lastly, you multiply by i cubed, so it's a little bit more uh, tricky. Um, so you uh, can remember that i cubed is actually negative i. Uh, and then if you do out the multiplication here, what you get is 3 minus 2i. So first off, uh, just by looking at these numbers, um, you can tell that there's something going on, right? You start out with, with 2 and 3. And then it's, you, you know you get two and three, then negative three and two, then negative two, negative three, three and negative two. There's some sort of pattern going on here, right? The two and three seem to be switching. There's kind of these negative signs that come and go. Um, so it's maybe a little bit hard to figure out what the pattern is just by looking at these numbers. But if we plot them in our complex plane, uh, you'll see uh, the pattern uh, hopefully pretty quickly. So if you put them on the complex plane, you have two plus three i there, right? Because one, two, one, two, three. Then you have negative three plus two i, because you go one, negative one, negative two, negative three, and the plus two i is one, two. And then same logic for these other two complex numbers. And then what you can see is that every time you uh, multiply by i, you're actually rotating by 90 degrees. So uh, maybe I can just draw in the arrows that'll make it more clear. So you multiply by i, and these are all 90 degrees, by the way. Hopefully you can see that. So these are all 90 degrees, and what we did here is you multiplied by i. And this process actually happens the same uh, for all of the other terms. Uh, so that is kind of, you can already begin to see that complex numbers they have a lot of great you know, algebraic properties and they can help you in a lot of ways there. Um, but they're also really cool to think about uh, visually and geometrically. Um, complex numbers, uh, I think one of the coolest things about them is that even though they're just numbers and you'd think that it's really just algebra, you just basically take a real number, define some new thing, i to be the square root of negative one, but then it really just opens up this whole new um, way of thinking about geometry. Uh, so this is a rotation by 90 degrees, and um, we can also reason this uh, algebraically. So we see this geometry with this example as a rotation by 90 degrees, but let's think about what this, what this means in the context of what we said earlier in terms of raising i to powers. So if we think about i to the fourth, in this context, uh, it means that we're rotating by 90 degrees, Right, so rotate 90. Uh, and then that to the fourth power. So if you think about what it means to rotate 90 degrees four times, like you can just imagine uh, standing right here, rotating 90 degrees, then rotating another 90 degrees, then you'd be facing the opposite direction, and then two more, and you'd be exactly where you are. So rotating 90 degrees, uh, hopefully you can convince yourself that that's the same thing as rotate, rotating 360 degrees, right? And then um, rotating 360 degrees is actually just the same thing as um, staying in place, right? 
360 degrees, you'll just end up exactly where you were. So then you get that I to the fourth geometrically is the same thing as staying in place. But if you remember way back ago when we were lifting I to some powers, we saw that I to the fourth equals one. So we can see both geometrically and algebraically, we can figure out that I multiplying by I to the fourth essentially does nothing. So you can think about rotations, rotating 90 degrees four times does nothing, you stay in place. Or you can think about algebraically. If you work out the numbers with I to the fourth, you'll get one and multiplying by one does nothing. So you can kind of begin to see there's this relationship between the algebra of complex numbers and the geometry of complex numbers. Uh, and then just a quick note. Um, so you can think of I uh, as having to do with rotation. So we saw it rotates by 90 degrees. And then just to think about what this means uh, for the real numbers, right? Because complex numbers have two components. Um, multiplication by negative one, uh, essentially what it does is it reflects. Uh, so if you uh, start at negative three plus two i and multiply by negative one, you reflect and you get uh, three minus two i. So um, we talked about complex numbers algebraically in terms of having that real and imaginary part and geometrically they kind of have this reflect and rotation part. Um, so that's a little bit uh, harder to grasp, but just wanted to get that sort of geometric intuition going. Um, and then uh, we'll just briefly talk a little, a little bit about some more geometry stuff, and then uh, that'll enable you to solve some really cool um, geometric complex number problems. So first there's this idea of um, the polar form of complex numbers. So you may or may not have seen uh, polar coordinates in, um, in a math class uh, in, in your own middle or high school. Um, but if you uh, hopefully know some trig, uh, if not, uh, then for this might be a little bit difficult, but if you know some trig, you can see that if you have this angle uh, theta and you know the distance is r, so in other words, the magnitude is r, um, then this is actually a whole new way of, of representing your numbers, right? So instead of it's x coordinate and y coordinate, you can think of each number as an angle. So this angle, we always do it from the x-axis just by convention, and then it's distance from the origin. And then we can set up these uh, conversions that are uh, somewhat useful to us um, uh, just by with, with some tricks. So you can see that uh, this length, which we typically denote by a, we've been having this as a, and this part being b for the a plus b i, so it's actually the same thing as r cos theta. And the b is actually the same thing as r sine theta. So then we can think of a plus bi as r cos theta plus i times r sine theta. And most of the time we just factor this r out. So we have r times cos theta plus i sine theta. So these are just some conversions. So as you can see, the x coordinate a is r cos theta, the y coordinate b is r sine theta. Um, this hopefully will make a, uh, sense to you just because R um, literally is just the magnitude. Radius is magnitude, and this is how we define magnitude. And um, if you're not okay with the definition, feel free to just think of it as Pythag. And then sometimes it's useful to figure out what theta is. So you can see here that tan theta opposite over uh, adjacent. So you have uh, tan theta is V over A. So that's just a quick um, introduction to polar. Um, so you can just spend very quickly just thinking about how to convert this rectangular form three plus four I, uh, to polar. Um, yeah, we are a little bit short on time, so we'll try to get through this fairly quickly. So maybe we'll just think about this for a minute, maybe less, uh, and then we'll try to get forward to, um, uh, some of the interesting problems. And then of course, if you have any ideas, feel free to put it in the chat. Yeah, Akash, I would suggest uh, if most people have that down, perhaps go back to the last page. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think conversions, so, yeah. Yeah, so just remember it's uh, three plus four, I believe was the example. Um, so, uh, feel free to use this as a guide in terms of converting. All right, so we're beginning to get some answers.
All right. Um, so why don't we just go over this one really quickly? So uh, if you want to convert to polar form, essentially you need two things, right? Uh, for rectangular, you need A and B. And for polar, you need R and theta. In other words, you need the magnitude and the angle. So for the magnitude, remember that it's equal to A squared plus B squared, the square, the square root of that. So you get it's the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 5. And then this angle, it isn't very nice, uh, but uh, tan theta is equal to 4 thirds. So tan, theta is equal to tan inverse of 4 thirds. And then you can plug that in into what z should be. And um, this may look really uh, uh, kind of um, uh, weird, but uh, you this tan inverse of 4 thirds really is just theta. It's the angle. So um, it might be a little bit simpler. Just think of it as the angle. And then um, there's this notation uh, called cis. So when you a lot of time you have cos theta plus i sine theta, and that's a little bit annoying to write out all the time. As you can see, it's getting pretty long. So um, cis theta is the same thing as cos theta plus i sine theta. So you see the c for cos, the i for i, and the s for sine. Um, so that's just shorthand notation. Um, we have another problem here. So again, we'll try to go through this very quickly. Um, so the goal is to convert uh, z equals to cis 30 degrees. So um, that's the same thing, by the way, as 2 times cos 30 plus i sine 30, if you're not comfortable with that shorthand notation yet. Uh, so I'll just let you get this down, and then um, we can go back to that slide with all the conversion formulas uh, to, to help you. All right, so hopefully everyone has this down. All right, some people are even putting the answers. So we'll just quickly go back to this slide, which I find to be pretty useful. Um, and then remember that you have r and theta. So r here is 2, theta here is 30 degrees. And what you want is A and B. So just think about how you can convert. All right, we're getting some more answers. So uh, again, we'll try to go through this one pretty quickly. So uh, we have that A is equal to R cos theta. That's the formula we have. And then uh, so theta here is 30 degrees and R is 2. So 2 cos 30 is root 3. Uh, very similar logic for B, so 2 sine 30 is 1, and then what we get is, e is equal to root 3 plus I. So the real part here is the root 3, and the um, imaginary part here, uh, there's kind of this invisible 1 that's being multiplied by the I, so the imaginary part is 1. Um, so now, I'm going to scan the chat real quick. Okay, it seems people are putting in more answers, so uh, let's try to move on to something a little bit more interesting. So we'll just go through this, and then after uh, you understand this, you should actually be able to um, solve some pretty interesting problems. So uh, this looks a little bit weird, but let me just try and break it down. So uh, you have two complex numbers. So this is the magnitude of the first one, and then this is the angle of the, of the uh, of first complex number, and likewise here. And you're saying that if you multiply them, you get this really weird looking equation. Uh, but if you think about what it really means, you're first saying that the magnitudes multiply, right? So what I mean by that is you take R1 and R2, the two magnitudes, and your magnitude of your new complex number is just the product of your old magnitudes, right? You take R1, R2, and multiply them. And then if you think about the angle of this new complex number, you're just adding the two angles, right? So you have theta as the, your old angle, alpha as your other old angle, and your new angle is you just add them together. So um, equation-wise, this looks a little bit abstract. Uh, but if you just think about what it means geometrically, you're just saying that the magnitudes multiply and the angles add. So uh, I, yeah, I was going to add, just like, just like this, you know, just ha having this intuition, like if we go back uh, and think about um, when we were multiplying uh, 3 plus 2i by i, you can, you can see like the, mag the magnitude essentially of what we're multiplying is, um, what we're multiplying by is i. So i has magnitude. Uh, one, and so that, that that's kind of the reason why like our our, our, th our threes and twos stay because our magnitudes are staying the same. Right. Um. And, and the idea uh, of our angles adding is essentially we're adding ninety degrees. Yeah, that's a great point. 
So um, just to reiterate that idea of multiplying by i, we said it's a rotation by 90 degrees. So um, we can actually even reason this uh, with, with that uh, theorem we're about to prove. Because um, if you think about what's the angle of i, so if we just plot i over here, i is right there, right? So this is i. And its angle is this angle, which is 90 degrees. So when we multiply 2 plus 3i by i, we multiply the magnitude. So the magnitude of i is just 1. So the magnitude stays the same. That's what I was saying. Uh, and then we add the angle. So we take its normal angle and add by 90. And if you add a 90 to an angle, that's just rotating by 90 degrees. So, so some people have also been mentioning, like, it has, um, is this kind of like multiplying vectors? Um, yeah, it's exactly like multiplying vectors. You know, we, we usually think of complex numbers when we plot them on the complex plane as vectors. Um, and another question I've been getting is a lot of people have been realizing, like, does it have anything to do with physics? Um, I, um, vectors in general have like a, are, are very heavily used in physics. And I would say as you get um, as you get through physics at a higher level, you also see a lot of complex numbers come into play. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there, here's just a quick proof. Um, don't worry yourselves too much about it as long as you just understand the geometric intuition. I think um, that would just be amazing. Um, so just a, a quick proof for those who are interested. Yeah, gosh, since we're running low on time, maybe like we uh, leave this like as an exercise to read. Sure, sure. All right. So I think that proof, feel free to read it when we post the slides, and um, it'll be on YouTube, of course, later. So feel free to check it out there. Um, but I think now that we understand this geometrically, um, it might be best just to move on to some problems. So here, we are not going to prove this anyway, um, but this is just um, an extension of what we said earlier. So this is just saying that. If you take a complex number and multiply it n times, the magnitude just multiplies n times. That's why you see an exponent. And then adding something n times is just multiplication. So you see that n theta uh, there. So showing that angles add and magnitudes multiply. Um, so uh, now that we know that angles add and magnitudes multiply, uh, this computing 1 plus i to the 12th power while before we, you know, we might have just expanded everything, that we probably don't want to expand something 12 times. Um, that'll be a lot of work. Uh, and since we have eight minutes left, I don't think we want to do this with our last eight minutes. So um, really think about how we can use um, angles adding and uh, magnitudes multiplying. And I guess the first hint, if you're confused as to what that means, it would be converted to polar form. So if you plot one plus i, what is the magnitude and what is the angle? In a little bit, me I can just convert it uh, to polar, uh, and then after that we can go over the whole thing. Yeah, gosh, I would just call it. Maybe yeah, just move we are on. a little short, so let's go with the solution. So this is the polar form. So the magnitude of one plus i, if we if we plot it on the plane, would be root two, right? So uh, if we put it on the plane, it would be around here. So then this part is root two, because uh, this is one and this is one. This is root two, and then you can obviously see this is 45 degrees, or in radians, we call it pi over four. Uh, and then if we use the fact that the magnitudes multiply, then we get the magnitudes multiply, so it's root two to the twelfth power, right? Because root two times root two times root two twelve times, and the angle uh, um, adds. So if you add pi over four twelve times, it's just pi over four times twelve. Then we just simplify these things a little bit. So two to the twelfth, uh, sorry, root two to the twelfth is two to the sixth, which is sixty-four, and then uh, pi over four times twelve is three pi, and then we can just subtract off two pi because that's just three sixty. Uh, so we get pi, and then um, Pi, which is the same thing as 180 degrees, by the way, if you don't know radians, 180 degrees is, of course, here. So that's negative 1. So this is really 64 times negative 1, which is negative 64. So um, now with this geometric way of thinking about complex numbers, these uh, giant computations, which before would take you a really long time to compute, um, now uh, can just take seconds with just knowing that magnitudes multiply and angles add. Um, so the remaining five minutes, we have this uh, one last problem here. 
Um, so maybe you can think about it just for a minute or two, um, and then we can uh, go over it. As, as you guys just think about it, um, I, I, I've seen uh, a couple things in the chat about um, about like um, how e how the how the number e comes into play. So um, technically, like it, it comes into play in a really nice way. So when we talk about cis theta or cosine plus i sine theta, um, we actually can denote that as e to the i theta. Um, and I, there's a really really nice identity. Um, I believe it's Euler's identity is what it's called. Um, that that that's a really nice statement, um, which says that e to the i, uh, e to the i pi plus one, uh, is equal to zero. Um, and I think uh, I mean I, I really like that one just because like it uses you know uh, two transcendental numbers uh, e and pi and it has uh, you know it comes it brings in imaginary numbers it has it, and it's very simple to state. So uh, a lot of you have been asking about that, but yes, um, this is exactly how, how uh, where this um, identity comes from. Um, yeah, so this is something called Euler's formula. So if you, oh, okay, I cannot draw a line. Sorry about that. Um, but if you uh, use that fact and remember uh, what the cos theta plus i sine theta means, if you just plug in pi, then what you get is cos pi plus i sine pi. So cos pi is negative one and i sine pi is zero. So you get e to the i pi is equal to negative one. And then if you add one to both sides, you get this really famous identity called Euler's identity, which is e to the i pi plus one equals zero. And um, it's really one of the most famous identities in, in really all of math, uh, just because it's uh, you have you know, five of the most important numbers uh, in math. You have E, which is really important. Um, if you don't quite know what E is, you probably will in about uh, two, three years when uh, you get introduced to a little bit of stuff about calculus. Um, I, we all learned what I is today. Pi, I'm sure you know pi about with circles and stuff. And um, one and zero are just so fundamental um, to what, to, to uh, math, not even just in the real numbers, but all other number systems. Um, uh, um, instead of also like going over this problem and you could leave it for uh, homework. Um, yeah, and sure, go sure, over sure. maybe a like, little bit of like the applications of like what we talked about today. Like where, where like what, what is like the use of like this like. Right, so, um, okay, yeah. we'll go over this tomorrow just as a hint if you guys want it. Um, just think of the triangle being the complex plane. So we'll go over that more in detail tomorrow. Um, and then uh, just a little bit on kind of going forward, what is there left to do in complex numbers? There's a lot we didn't cover. So I didn't anticipate doing Euler stuff, but um, it's kind of cool that we just knocked that out today, which is nice. Um, so there's something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which complex numbers play a huge role in. Um, roots of unity is a very, very big concept. Um, so that's something uh, if you're curious to look up. Um, and then fractals. Fractals are, uh, if nothing else about math, they just look really, really cool. Um, so even if you're not a math person and you're trying to explain uh, math stuff to other people and they just don't get it and they're like, I don't know why you like math, just show them a fractal and they'll think you're super cool. Uh, the second slide of the day, I'll just go back to it because we had a fractal there. Fractal. This is actually a fractal. So um, this is actually a pattern you get by working with complex numbers. Um, I believe this is the Mandelbrot set. Um, yeah, so this is just a zoomed in version of the Mandelbrot set. So feel free to look up Mandelbrot sets and Julia sets. Um, they're super interesting mathematically and also visually just really cool to look at. Um, so one more, one, one more feel that like is really, really good is uh, that, I, I, that I think for, that we've seen is uh, in number theory. Uh, like just just like in complex numbers and like just like imaginary numbers come up a lot whether it's like with quadratic fields um, that, that that's a little higher up but like even when you're dealing with like sums of squares and like thinking thinking about like what things can be represented as sums of squares like this goes back to Pythag um, but it's actually a number theory question and, and, and a lot of techniques on finding like oh how can we form uh, you know new new um, how can we find which numbers can be represented as sums of squares uh, really deals with complex numbers um, just because of like that idea of like norm uh, 
in magnitude that we talk uh, norm, yeah, norm, uh, mostly, but yeah. Yeah. All right, as always, if any part was confusing, this video will be on YouTube in like a couple hours. And if you don't get an email with the homework, check out our website or YouTube. And hopefully you guys will join us tomorrow as well. We're doing something really, we're doing game theory tomorrow, which is like really <laughs> interesting and probably something mm, I, would, I would say most people like don't learn in high school. So yeah. I definitely tune in, even in both sessions, so there'll definitely be interesting stuff. It's my favorite topic in math. And yeah, we don't learn it in our high school quiz and I took a class out of school. That was probably one of my favorite classes this year. So get excited. Um, so yeah. All right, Thank so we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you all for coming. Um, and yeah, looking forward to tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah. And all these slides are going to be on uh, our website. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Everything will be on our website. Slides. Uh, look on YouTube. Uh, subscribe. Yeah. Subscribe, of course. All right. See you all tomorrow. See you guys.